。エタリーユスキあ、エタリーめー。よく出ねばらにラッキーばしてくれて。おー、ノープスさらに。Let's begin. Indeed. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Honey Badger Radio. My name is Brian, and this is the Fireside Chat. On today's Fireside Chat, We're going to be, we're, we're, I'm going to try and do like a series of、uh, talks with people involved with Gamergate.、Uh, Gamergate is 10 years old.、Um, this year it will be 10 years old. And apparently it's been like resurfacing in the news. So I, I think it's just a weird sort of coincidence that this stuff is going on. And today I got with me Ray, if that's okay, if I, because I see your name there, Ray. Who is the documentarian responsible for a really great movie that I think you guys should check out if you can?、Um, it's called Airplay AM, right? And、uh, you can watch the full first part of it, which is like about an hour long, I think it is.、Um, well, an hour and 45 minutes, but there's also another half of the movie, maybe even more, because it's about two hours and some change. On his Patreon, and it's totally worth it. In fact,、um, if you guys have been following us for a while,、uh, Honey Badger Radio and the ICMI make a cameo in the second half. Uh, uh, well, not just a cameo, we're actually featured a little bit. So,、uh, welcome to the show, Ray. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Well,、oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I appreciate、uh, you coming on. So, Um, I, I did like a part of an interview with you on, on the other channel, which is Honey Badger Arcade,、uh, which is more about gaming and culture. But, but、um, I think that the people who watch us should, like on this channel, should also know. So just, we're just putting you guys out there more so if we're able to, you know?、Um, so I do already see people in the chat giving it complimentary comments. Mangaka over on Rumble. What's up, Rumble Gang? Says,、uh, pretty good overall. I'd say it's worth the watch. And Mr. 0303 says, awesome, I'll give it a watch. Yeah, I totally agree that you should check it out.、Um, he is basically making the first part of it available to anyone, which I'm playing in the background right now.、Um, and there is definitely some stuff that you probably have forgotten that happened in this, in this particular time period.、Um, and I would definitely check it out. But the second half is totally worth it, too.、Um, Just join his Patreon, and I'm going to put the Patreon in the in the description of this video. And、uh, yeah, show him show him some love and、uh, you know, check it out because it's totally worth it. So, let me ask you,、uh, Ray, how, how,、uh, how much feedback have you gotten? Have you gotten much feedback about this since you released it? Yes, I've yes, been getting, getting plenty of feedback, feedback. plenty of.、Yeah. New patrons, new patrons and again getting a lot of likes on social media, whatnot. Mostly positive. Some who, some negative from some who don't even bother to watch the movie.、Mm -hmm. But yeah, so far it has been mostly positive. One of Promote this more. Hopefully, by the 10th anniversary of Gamergate, I can have some kind of official release on streaming networks and whatnot, possibly theatrical、uh, presentations. Hopefully,、uh, by, that, by that time, we'll have some kind of physical media release if we can get that. And yeah, hopefully, he can. More people will sign up to the Patreon and we'll be able to get that done by the by the latter half of this year. Would you say that the feedback was overall like positive, negative?、Um, Most, mostly positive. And, uh, and um, what do you think about 
Okay, so you you're using the Patreon, which I think, you know, it's totally worth the money. Are are you planning on using some of the funds from the Patreon to essentially like make it into a theatrical presentation? Like, because I I assume that costs money, right? Is that is that what your plan is? Yeah. Or? Right now, I'm putting most of the Patreon funds into the further promotion and distribution of the film. I also want to get an original score commissioned and whatnot. I've got merch on a Teespring store that I haven't promoted much, mostly t-shirts and whatnot. Oh, merch. Yeah. yeah. What what um what are some of the designs? I mean, or 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 they're not available yet. They're available on the Teespring store. I'll I'll send you over. I'll uh, send you the link. It's All right. Do you have a favorite design? I pretty much just have one design now. If oh, can... <laughs> what's the design? It's the uh, poster design that you can see on the Patreon end. Is it the artwork that Kukurio made? Or yeah. I hope to okay so more. yeah yeah i hope to commission more once well you know i know kukurio if you need to get in touch with him he still he still makes um lots of artwork and i think uh he loved doing all of the vivian james stuff i mean he and i were both making a lot of vivian james art and uh but he made those comics and it was like constant so you know if you wanted to um you know, like reach out to him. I can put you in touch with him. I, I'm in. Oh, you're already in touch with him. Yeah, he's the one who com. I commissioned him to uh, illustrate the uh, poster image, pretty much the thumbnail image that you see. Uh, I see. Okay. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And um. So. So you said that the, you got mostly positive feedback. Um, well, let me, just for people who don't know, uh, what was your reasoning for making this documentary to begin with? Like, why did you decide that you wanted to make this? Well, I saw the media representing, misrepresenting a group of people in a way that was defamatory and... I wanted to do something to counteract that. That's one yeah. reason. And another reason was that it was... Gamergate was the first controversy to occur almost entirely online through social media. So there's just a wealth of videos and articles and social media posts. Live that... streams and whatnot that could be done that could be assembled into a feature film that could be assembled into a feature film so i kind of took it as a challenge to create a film entirely out of that found material mm-hmm mm-hmm um, I, I'm being told that, well, earlier I was told that there's some echo. Let me know if there still is in the chat. I, it shouldn't be an issue now, but let me know if there, if it still is. Um, so you were like, did you have ever have a personal experience with Gamergate? Like maybe some interaction on social media, maybe some, um, article, maybe even like a product that you liked or disliked that was being pushed on you? Like, do you have any personal experience with this? Well, my introduction to the subject could not have come from a less sympathetic source. At the time, of, I was a frequent reader of Badass Digest, which was the official film blog of the Alamo Draft House and 
as you know, the editor in chief of the time was one Devin Farasi. And mm -hmm. at the uh, beginning of the controversy, the first things that they wrote about it were just these incredibly scathing, very, very, very negative pieces that I had no context for. So the, the, it just seemed extraordinarily hateful with comparisons to racists like the Klan and Nazis and whatnot. And it all just seemed just see it seemed to come out of nowhere mm -hmm. so so i thought of doing some research into it and had some communication yeah. with uh devin farasi on twitter he insulted me and blocked me which is which was very upset which was kind of upsetting at the time did did was he like someone that you admired maybe because i know that one of the things that you know when you're when you're kind of an introvert uh and maybe you have like a hobby that you occupy your time with and you grow to admire the people who are you know you see as a kind of advocate for what you do like you know adam sessler people would always say that he was like you know he wasn't like those other game journalists because um he would stick up for the gamer you know angry joe they would say that and so you build like a kind of i wouldn't say idolization but like you know respect or admiration for someone that you see is like they're sort of like destigmatizing your hobby and uh, is this did you feel this way about Devin Farasi? Well, I admired the guy's work. I did know that he had a reputation for being kind of a jackass. Sure. Uh, yeah, that's what I mean. Like, it's like, it don't was, meet your heroes, right? Yeah. Well, I wouldn't call him a hero, but I did no. admire. But I did admire the guy. His work. He's a pretty pretty talented writer, and a lot of the other people over at Badass Die. They just, they're a talented writer. There's film crit Hulk. He's one of the personalities who used to be over there. He wrote a pretty good uh, book about screenwriting that I bought. That I bought. And he was another one of those most vociferous voices against Gamergate. And you know, there was a time, there was a and as you might know, Devin Farasi was later outed as for you know, for having committed some kind of like sexual harassment or something. Yeah, is that what you? Yeah, people, right. Was yeah, it was it really serious or? I had like a. I can't remember. I but I do vaguely remember something like that. Yeah, it was. Yeah, and it was kind of expected by me because his because his like responses to Gamergate were so hateful, so mm. so vociferous that I can't I couldn't help but assume that it was that it was that he had something to hide and no doubt he did so yeah i it was through them that i was first introduced to gamer that i was first introduced to gamergate it wasn't the first time i was introduced and also they were it wasn't the first time i was introduced to anita sarkeesian i was a follower of Thunderfoot and many of the other new atheist types, and they were very, and they, 
did a pretty good job of arguing against her. TJ Kirk, the amazing atheist, they were very, did a very good job of count making the counterpoint to Sarkeesian's claims and that, and the more the press put her on a pedestal, the more I just thought that this was suspicious because as you can see by most recent tweet that one of my most recent tweets that has been blowing up recently got over 2,000 likes in two days. Yeah. And it's where I just really lay into Anita Sarkeesian. I just really lay into Anita Sarkeesian because her criticism is just plain terrible. It is. And, and even by feminist standards and it's the fact that this is the one that that this is the person that the press decided to prop up as the feminist standard in video games and media just really kind of disgusted me so i decided mm -hmm. to do more uh, research into Gamergate and found that the uh, media that the image presented by the media by most of the uh, mainstream media outlets were com were completely inaccurate. I in gamer Gamergate is quite possibly the most diverse creative community in terms of just race, gender, sexuality, uh, and and politics that I've ever seen. And then yeah. trying to scapegoat them as scapegoat them as just a bunch of right wing male white male misogynists was I just thought was disgusting. Mm -hmm. It was and it wasn't the first time that I was in that I've seen this kind of behavior on the part of the media just completely just completely denigrating an entire group of people. I live on Long Island and my first real documentary project right out of college was a documentary about the Shorm nuclear power plant where I live on Long Island, New York. It ran $4 billion over budget with before being shut down without ever any kind, without producing a single megawatt, megawatt of power. And that was mainly because of public outcry about concerns regarding safety standards and whatnot. There was a lot of fear. Sure, yeah. Against nuclear power. But well, I think there still is in a way. Public, yeah. Yeah. And I found, and it wasn't really a problem because, and from what I found in my research, it wasn't, really a problem of experts not communicating to the public of what the science was, what the... It wasn't... A, oh, so, so you're saying that people were afraid, uh, but, it, but there was probably something that should have been communicated. Um... And the, well, the what the idea is that the experts or the the, the nuclear physicists or whoever um, yes. didn't. It's not that they didn't do a good job of communicating it was the issue, the right? Press that was doing that was working pretty much not, ah. not in a quid pro quo way, not in a quid yeah. pro quo way, but really kind of perpetuating a narrative that was very beneficial to 
some that was very beneficial to fossil fuel interests and they were the one and fossil fuel and fossil fuel interests were part of the were really on board with the narrative that the press was perpetuating this fear-based narrative that the press was perpetuating and mm -hmm. in our research we were me and my journalist collaborator we were able to find a full page ad that was printed in newsday against the shoreham plant saying in big type solar not nuclear mm -hmm. and in little and in little type right underneath that saying paid for in the public interest by the oil heat institute of long island and ah uh. yeah that ad found its way in the documentary pandora's promise directed by academy award nominated filmmaker robert stone which you can watch on itunes and many other streaming services right now i highly mm -hmm. recommend it and yeah and as the filmmaking and as the project went on as we were uncovering you know just really 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 obvious instances of journalistic misconduct on the part of the press i was really taken back by my journalist collaborators just excuses that he was making for these people things that were just very clear and obvious instances of journalistic malpractice so and that led to a falling out and that led to us and to a suspicion that there is a kind of on my part that there is a kind of unspoken fraternity a, a kind of unspoken partnership between a lot among journalists that there is just a kind of mentality that you don't criticize your own yeah right and it's so like a, it's like this uh cl click thing yeah and so when gamergate came up and it was a controversy involving journalists right People you're basically you basically had you had a, a kind of encounter with um journalists behaving badly before gamergate happened and like i was i i said this on a stream i did earlier today your pattern recognition kicked in <laughs> and you were like yeah. wait a minute i've seen this before and it's very similar right yeah that journalists have a habit of defending other journalists mm -hmm. and so when a controversy within the video game space and i'm a gamer myself i've played game i've played video games all of my life and kept up with the uh, coverage of video games, even when during a period around college that I couldn't invest so much in video games, I always stayed on top of the news about them. Sure. That when this controversy came down in the video game in space, I was, I, was personally informed about the history of the game's press, how these controversies about, you know, whether there is corruption in the press have always been talked about. I knew that was always going on. So I, so these accusations of misogyny and these attempts by the greater mainstream press to kind of defend the gaming press really kind of sounded hollow in my really kind of sounded 
hollow in my estimation. Yeah. Yeah, so... So you had some first-hand experience with uh, this journalistic practices being not quite up to snuff, um, probably based on your education and your interest in... I mean, like, did, did you go to school to be... Well, first of all, before I ask you this question, um, everybody, welcome to the show. If you're new, I see that people are, like, coming in and watching... Uh, I am talking with Ray of at Airplay Doc on Twitter. Um, there's a link in the description to his Twitter as well as his video. It's a documentary on Gamergate, but it's only part one. Uh, go to his Patreon. There is a link in the description of the video that my video links to, but I'll also add it in the low bar after this is over. Uh, so you guys can just like cut to the cut to the chase. Um, and we are discussing Gamergate because uh, Gamergate's 10 years old. Th this is a good um, documentary. I recommend it. I paid his Patreon for the other half, and it's totally worth it. I think it's better than the first half. Um, so I would definitely check it out. He's hoping to release it in theaters. I think it's, you know, some people might say, like, um, that this is just about video games, but it's obviously not. It, it's just... <laughs> It's a it's it's not about that really. I mean this specifically is, but it is a bigger conversation that I think is important to have. And uh we at Honey Badger Radio were pretty invested when it was happening, not just because we are also gamers, but also because we could see um you know what was happening in Gamergate to the uh to the audience, to the customer base, to the gamers, the people who built and supported and invested in this hobby were being attacked by the people who they're just, just tourists i mean let's be real they're tourists they didn't really want to do this they were hoping to be um journalists of a greater stripe you know that they they thought they were they could do something greater than this they just had to start somewhere and i think uh, that's how we got here so check out his links in the description um and, you know, be sure to send us a super chow by going to feedthebadger.com forward slash just the tip. If you want to uh, send us a comment, ask a question of Ray and um, also please support our fundraiser. We are still actively doing the fundraiser right now. And that is also at feedthebadger.com forward slash support. Thank you. All right, let's continue. So did, you went to school. Did you want to be like a filmmaker, a documentarian? Did you have something else in mind? Like what, what was the, uh, why do you want to do that? Filmmaker mainly. Yeah. I've just always had a lifelong interest in media and just, it was me. My uh, degree covered mostly film, but I, had a lifelong interest in film, TV, movies, whatever, any kind of media. So, mm -hmm. and, and also mass media, I've always been interested in the way that media can perpetuate narratives and, you know, in some ways deceive or convince people of what is or is not really happening so i was pretty so prepped for this controversy that it was something that i've really been keenly interested in for much of my entire life yeah so um What, what were some unexpected discoveries you made while, you know, essentially putting this together with, because I mean, you were, you knew about it when it started and you were sort of like gathering, you know, archival information, videos, uh, articles, blogs, whatever you get your hands on so that you can like create essentially a timeline of events and you were using, uh, Grimachu's book as sort of like a framework. Um, but were there any things that you discovered that you 
that sort of like um I don't know changed you in some way or or did you did you did everything shake out pretty much how you expected? And I should probably mention that I pretty I pretty much used uh, James Desborough's uh, book Inside Gamergate as the narration for this film. So I was pretty much going off of what he was saying, what he was saying and what I could recall. So there was not too much, uh, there were not too many surprises when making the documentary. Yeah. I was, was uh, there. Well, in terms of the actual information, the K, the uh, case is probably some of my uh, favorite discoveries were just the were just the culture and creations around Gamergate because there were just so many create so many creative works like we've mentioned the artwork of Kuruku of is it Kukurio? Kukurio, yeah, yeah. Kukurio. And there is a lot of Gamergate artwork. Kukurio was probably the most prolific, but but there was some there's uh I have a vague recollection of somebody who actually went on to work on like professionally and it's like a Vivian and she's holding a torch. It's really really like professionally done. Yeah. There was definitely a lot of really great art that came out of this. Uh, yeah, I believe thing. that's in the second part as well. And a lot of music. You can see Dr. Random yes. Cam is in the... There is a lot of Dr. Random Cam music. And yep, a lot of Random Cam Ray. music, Rucka Rucka Ali, um, yeah. and some others too. Chris Raygun had a couple songs on there. Yeah, yeah. Rekord Ali, oddly enough, had had no familiarity with Gamergate. He was just uh, no, no, I know, because it just so happened. But there was this is the thing about Gamergate. It not the people who contributed in a way they may not have been aware of it, or it came a bit later. Like the one song by Rucka was um, the Sargon song. And of course, Carl was involved from the start. Uh, you know, at that time, we used to have him on our show pretty regularly, along with Oliver Campbell and uh, James Desborough and others. Um, they were sort of regulars, honestly. Yeah. So, yeah, it's kind of weird because <laughs> like Carl's doing like completely different stuff now. It's just it's weird, like how like this. I think was a kind of like. You know like a watershed moment for people i don't know if you agree with that i mean i know it seems trivial but yeah and i still follow and still follow some of them to this day like shoe on head chris reagan uh i'm sorry carl benjamin as you mentioned and mostly everybody who was at vidcon 2017 I yeah. wanted to use as many people who were like in that who were really in that image because not only was it not only was it a alter not only was it a notorious altercation between uh, Anita Sarkeesian and Carl Benjamin, who was a well-known figure, e-celeb within Gamergate at the time. Yeah. But it was kind of the accumulation of this culture that really kind of defined itself in those uh, few days, a culture that a real, honest counterculture to what is the dominant culture. Yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, you know, we were there, uh, VidCon yeah. 2017. Yeah, I mean, well, obviously, we, we recorded after Carl was, um, I guess you could say, like, verbally called out. Uh, I was sitting right next to Dave Cullen, who was also 
um, there. And honestly, I haven't seen Dave since, but we, um, you know, a lot of people like look at VidCon 2017 and they mostly just reflect on those kind of sound bites and those like highlight moments. But for me, uh, I was there with my wife and um, we were just hanging out with people that we, you know, have talked to online forever. It was just like, you know, I don't know. It was, it was just hanging out with friends, you know, that's how I saw it. So I got to hang out with uh, Dave Cullen and he and I are, you know, we don't see each other anymore, but I think we're pretty close. We talk on, on um, Telegram sometimes. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't regret it. It was, you know, he's a good dude. So it's, it's just nice to think about that. Uh, Bud Badenser, Badenser says, hello, what is this channel about? Thank you. This, um, this is Honey Badger Radio. I might as well just tell you, uh, this is the live streaming channel for Honey Badger Radio, which is also a YouTube channel. We talk about, uh, we are creative people, uh, artists and uh, musicians and comedians and um, even like filmmakers. But on this channel, we talk about mostly the issues facing men and boys. Um, but on this, but we also talk a lot about things like censorship and, and media bias. And this is kind of what this show is about is I'm speaking with Ray here. He made a great documentary um, called Airplay AM that you can watch. Uh, not now because you're you're here. So stay with us. But after the show is over, go to the link in the description and watch his documentary about Gamergate. Because if you don't know anything about it, um, you should. So uh, Senior Six says Gamergate like our Vietnam seems like forever. <laughs> <laughs> Son, let me tell you about Gamergate. No. It all started with a gorilla. No, but, um, huh? Uh, What'd you I say? I was just laughing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so anyway, yeah, so the, the air, um, sorry, that was, that was a good time. So, um, what I was going to say yeah. is, um, oh, yeah. So have you heard the news? And this is actually since I talked to you, apparently it's Gamergate 2 now. You know about this? Yeah. <laughs> and this is something yeah. about can you and maybe you uh, will document this as well and we'll get a sequel to your movie. Um is this about localization? Is that is that yeah, what yeah. okay, so tell people a little bit about it in case they don't know. Oh well, I don't know too much about it, but it is there has been I've not been involved in it too much but there has been yeah. controversies going on within the uh anime community that about how a how a work how work of anime gets translated from Japanese to English and that there are instances where translators have been putting in their personal politics memes and just kind of just their own cultural worldview in anime where it didn't already exist now if you're a if you're a fan of if you've been a fan of anime going long back you know that there these or even just films in general that there are are issues when you translate a work that was originally in a different language to uh, another language that things get lost in translation. Things don't all the references and uh, expression and cultural re references and expressions and languages don't always fit one to one within a Trans when you're translating a work yeah this goes even back to even back to film like there's some uh like uh, some fo foreign language films that when they were dubbed in english that that kind of really changed the emotional bearing of it like mm -hmm. one one of my uh this is gonna get show the uh film the cineast side of me the film nerd side of me where there is 
one of the best films that I've ever watched is Enmar Bergman's uh, Winter Light, and it's about a Lutheran priest who believes that his lack of faith contributes to the suicide of a parishioner. And there comes a moment in the film where he's just got back from informing the man's wife about his suicide, and she has to go tell to her children, and he's in the car with his ex-wife, and he's in the car with his ex-wife, regretting every single moment in his life up to that point. And in the Swedish, in the original Swedish, he says, you know, my parents always wanted me to become a priest. Just mm. re really impactful moment. And in the English dub, which is on the Criterion DVD, which you can get, he says, my parents forced me to become a priest. And oh, that's yeah, that changes just, it a lot. Yeah. And so yeah. you can imagine that. In and I assume that you prefer the original Swedish version. Yeah. Yeah. My, mainly, I prefer the to watch things in the original language whenever I can, with the exception for kaiju movies and kung fu movies. Because that you're probably not missing much. With Maybe kaiju not. movies? Yeah. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> well, I... I, I I prefer to watch things in the original language. The thing is, the localization is not limited to dubbing, though. I think they changed the subtitles, too. Um, and it's not limited to anime. It's uh, basically Japanese film media, whether it's anime or, um, you know, like a live action film. And it's also, I know that there are examples of this in video games as well, like Japanese video games, where they're like adding in sort of like things that are culturally unique to you know the west um yeah. and and they're and and they're not even like necessarily things that we would consider normal here either it's just like the way that they're sort of like pushing you know this this kind of progressivism into our media i mean i don't know if i'm being fair or not but or just not translating anything at all because yeah i've seen instances where a person is doing a comparison with between the english translation and the japanese video game and it's just you see them going through pages and pages of text and in the american english release that it's just ellipses 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 oh yeah i don't i don't remember what that was from but that gives me pause to think about all the times i've seen an ellipses in the final fantasy games i've played yeah over the years that's true uh i have seen that a lot too and i i do wonder about that you know there are there is a way to do this well because i have watched some uh japanese shows where you know, if there is something that is, like, culturally very, very Japanese, they'll usually add a disclaimer that defines it, like, to give you the context, you know? Like, this is in reference to this thing. And then that way you can... I, I prefer everything to be in whatever it was intended by the original creator, because that's what art is. Like, I, I don't want it filtered through somebody else. So, yeah. Um, yeah, there's one instance I can think of off the top of my head from uh from Azuman Gadayo where there uh, that's probably my favorite anime of all time of all time where where one of the characters to Tomo Chan creates the other members of the cast now in J in the English translation She's saying, what's the story, Morning Glory? It's a reference to an Oasis album. But in the Japanese, it was a reference to the band, the uh, gr musical group Morning Museum. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to make a pun on their name or reference. Oh, I see. I can't recall yeah. it. 
But, you know, that's an instance where something doesn't really translate well from culture to culture, so you have to take something... You have to, like, make some kind of close yeah. estimate to change it, or, you know, so yeah. that it makes more sense. Yeah. Uh, I got a super chow from Richard Bier. He gives us $5 and says, Gamergate 2, Return of the Sarkeesian. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Uh, I don't think... Now, now Go ahead. Chow. I, I just got to ask, Chow, is that a reference to the Sonic the Hedgehog Chow? Or... Richard Bier says, Gamergate 2, Return of the Sarkeesian. What do you mean? Uh, who, who are you talking about? The C-H-A-O. The C H A O. I've, oh, oh, Chow. I'm not familiar with Chow. I don't know. If it is, is that just let, let us know. If it is. Um. Thank you for the super Chow, Richard. So we got it. We got like ten minutes. So um, and then we're gonna go to the patron show and talk to the patrons once again, guys. Uh, follow the this gentleman on Twitter. It is at Airplay Doc. Uh, there's a link in the description. And watch his video. Go to his Patreon. Support this movie if you can. It's uh, I thought it was really well done. So um, let me ask you this. this is going to be a bit of a weird question. But since you found out that we were involved in Gamergate. But our content normally is not about that uh what are your thoughts on on honey badger radio and what we do well i don't really listen to it well i don't really listen to it much yeah so fair enough really so listen. so then what have you wondered like what our um connection to this is like why did we host people and talk to them and stuff not really. No? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Oh, he's asking for the name of the Super Chow? Oh, Super Chow. Oh, I see what you mean. Okay. Uh, It's Allison. Let, I'll explain. So, in YouTube, you have Super Chats, right? You, you put yeah. a little money in. Um, And since our website for hosting, you can send Super Chats, but they're not done through YouTube. They're done through our website. And the website's called Feed the Badger. So Allison called them Super Chow. So C-H-O-W, like like uh -huh. chow, like food. So it's like feeding the badger, right? So it's so own... that's where the chow comes from, yeah. Yeah, so it's your own proprietary, uh, your... Uh, in, yeah, our own, our, yeah, our own system for that. It's Allison's system, really. Yeah. Oh, um, uh, so you don't have to share anything with the third party? Exactly. Well, there is still, I think that we do Super Chows still, there's a little that comes off the top because of the processing um, system, you know, takes a little money, but it's not like Super Chats. Like Super Chats, I think Google takes like 30% or 50%. And Rumble takes like, you know, 20% or something like that. But Super Chows, we almost get 100%. I think it's like a very small percentage. So Allison prefers Super Chow. Also, if you do Super Chows, you have a lot more characters to work with. So, you know, you can send a longer message. Um, I think there's a character limit on Super super Chats and Rumble Rants. But Super Chows, you can like send, I wouldn't say like, you know, a huge. But some people send pretty big Super Chows though. Like very long, you know. Like the one, well, yeah, this one is short that Richard sent, but we do get longer ones and they go into our discord. So, you know, you could make um, like requests with it and send links with it and things like that. So uh, also super Chows are not subject to YouTube's um, algorithmic adjustments. So, you know, like it, it, sometimes super chats get censored, but YouTube still takes the money um, depending on the content. So, okay. that's the that that's a little bit of backstory on that. Now I understand what the context is. Uh, the um, door is, is asking if I've seen the morning. 
after by Christopher Hitchens. No, but I am familiar with Christopher Hitchens. If you didn't notice, I opened the film with a Christopher Hitchens quote. Oh, so you're looking at the chat. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a documentary about the death of Princess Diana. Yeah. Uh, he's asked me to watch it, but I haven't had a chance. Might check it out, though. Yeah. So, um... Uh, so when okay go ahead uh, yeah the hitchens quote in particular is i became a journalist partially so i wouldn't have to rely on the press for information it's a good quote because i think it really it really establishes that there is a diff that there is a noticeable di that there is a difference between the press and the act of journalism that the and that the two aren't always uh that the two aren't always in our tw that that they're not always that, uh in 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 sync that the two are not uh oh always distinct that the two are not always di indistinguishable from each other and mm -hmm. that i consider doc I consider documentary filmmaking to be a separate act apart from journalism. Is, so it's not saying that I myself am participating in an act of journalism. I find de uh, documentary filmmaking to be a very different you know, practice, very different yeah. art form. When you're call yourself a journalist you have to adhere to some kind to far more rigorous standards mm. and that's part of the reason why this film exists is because there's a lot of people calling themselves journalists and not adhering to any kind of standards yeah i see what you mean i see what you mean um okay so I was going to ask you a question. Now I'm having trouble remembering it. Um, oh, yeah. About the theater. So, so you're because we got like five minutes, but this is a good opportunity to bring up uh, what you're hoping to do. So you've been getting some support. And what you're hoping to do is put this film in theaters, or at least do some screenings of it. So what I was going to mention is I think this might be a good route to take or look into. Um. I can think of two instances of this. So years ago, there was a woman that made a, a documentary about men's rights activists. It was called The Red Pill by Cassie J. Are you familiar with Cassie J and The Red Pill? Yeah. I've okay. Seen the You've seen the movie? Yeah. Oh, okay. So Cassie J was not able to do a, you know, like a regular theatrical release of the film. And none of the streaming services wanted to put it on their platform at least not at first this was around 2016 or 2017 as well because before i was at vidcon i was in australia and we were um you know cassie j was there and she was on an australian news program that basically like dragged her over the coals uh over making this movie to begin with but the, what I'm getting at is, though, in order for her to get her film out there, she hosted screenings, but she also had a way for people to host screenings in their own town. So they could set up a stream, uh, like a, a way to screen the film in their own home city. And I hosted a, a screening of her movie in Chicago. And it was, I you know... Um, she had a way of setting it up. I, I would I would ask that you look into it. Maybe you've already done this, but if you did, I would do this for you as well. I would, you know, I'm in Roanoke, Virginia. It's a, oh. a small city of like 300,000 people, but I bet I could get uh, people to come to the Grandin Theater and watch it at least, you know, like the first half or maybe even the full thing. I don't know how you want to do it. Um but uh uh but yeah and then what what we what i what we did with the red pill is because i went to a couple of screenings that we had one in new york we had one in la i think there was one in, in 
Texas, and I did one in Chicago, and I stayed after, uh, the, I, I introduced it, I hosted it, we screened it, and then I took questions and comments after, and I think that would be really good for your documentary. So, um, I don't know, I just want to put it out there so you think about it, but it worked out well for Cassie J, and I think uh, Dr. Jordan Peterson also, I was... I think it was, maybe it was his speaking tour, but he also was, uh, I was trying to get him in Chicago again for a speaking tour he was doing. Um, and uh, that was also a thing. So this, this uh, my point is, is that this, I think this is, I don't know if you've considered this, but this is definitely a route you can take. If you can get the theatrical release, we can help you spread the word, you know? Sure, absolutely. I want to do something something with this film for the 10th anniversary of Gamergate and part and one idea I've just have, have is to just have a theater is to have some kind of theatrical release and hopefully we can like have free Doritos and Mountain Dew for all <laughs> uh, that <laughs> that would be funny for sure yeah um, yeah, we were giving out we, at the ICMI 2019, which is also, ICMI 2019 was also featured in your, in part two of your documentary. Um, and we were giving out milkshakes because at nice. that time people were having milkshakes thrown at them. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so we were giving them out. <laughs> All right. So, um, do you have any final things you want to say to the audience? And then we're going to go into the patron only content. So don't leave, but if any final words for our audience. Uh, other than uh, watch the film, watch Airplay on patreon.com slash metalheadfilms. And that's all I have to say. Are you familiar? Did I already ask you this? Are you familiar with Metal Gate? Which was like, yeah, it was a very brief, <laughs> something but... very concurrent with, uh, yeah, with Gamergate yeah. and everybody ignored it. And, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, they were going after really the wrong people at that point. But yeah. all right, and I got one super chow from Richard Bierre. Thank you, Richard. He gives us five dollars and he says, How many journalists are standing in solidarity with Julian Assange, by the way? I don't know. Uh, do you know? I know uh Matt Taibbi at Racket yes. on Substack is has been very supportive of, of Assange. I know a few other is, and you know, I don't really know many more journalists. I know Vivek Ramaswamy when he was running for president that he was that he said the first day that the first thing he was going to do on day one was pardon Assange, and that was really weird. That yeah. And yeah. that he was the only politician who was, uh, and I think uh, Andrew Yang has said that he would that if he was president, he would have pardoned Assange. But aside from that, mm -hmm. it's weird that nobody is that very few people within the journalistic profession are willing to speak up for him. Yeah, May I guess mainly because they see themselves as part of the they see themselves as part of the establishment. Yeah, it's quite possible. Yeah. All right. Well, so we're gonna end the show here. We're gonna go into the patron show and hang out with the patrons. So uh, please, like I said, Ray, if you can stick around. If not, it's okay. Um, okay. but I'm going to leave the rest of you guys. I, uh, I would definitely ask that you check out all that, all that stuff. Are you still, you still game? Uh, do I still game? Yeah. Yes. I, I've been thinking of like starting live streaming, starting to oh. live streaming, but I don't know what's the uh, first thing to, uh, I'm well, what kind of games much. do you like? Well, I've got... Let's see. I who all kinds of games. I really have 
I actually have all of the video game consoles I grew up with in the apartment where I live right now. Well, we'll talk. We're gonna get into this in the patron show, so hang in there because I want to talk about games. So, um, if you guys want to join us, you have to become a badger by going to feedthebadger.com and setting up a monthly subscription. Five bucks a month will get you into our Discord, where you'll be able to participate in all in in all of the additional conversations, watch a lot of additional content, hang out with um this great community and some of our guests uh so hopefully we'll see you guys there and uh uh yeah to check it out and anyway so with that said if you guys like this video please hit like subscribe if you're not already subscribed hit the bell for notifications leave us a comment let us know what you guys think about what we discuss on the show today and please 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 share this video because sharing is caring thank you so much for coming on today's episode of the fireside chat and we'll talk to you all in the next video are machines dude okay they are literal machines they are talking point machines they are impossible to fucking deal with especially if you have like especially if you have like a, a couple dudes who have good memory on top of that too holy shit you're fucked